so I'm going to teach you guys today some pre-pressing. Uh, pre-press is essentially preparing your files for long-run printing, um, which most game designers will either hire someone to do or do themselves. Um, but just so you know who I am and why I'm teaching this, I'm Alicia Volkman. Um, I'm a game designer, uh, just like you guys. You may have seen some of my stuff, you may have not. Um, Underlings of Underwing is published through Pericles Group. Armor Up, I did myself locally in Minnesota. I'm in a couple local game stores out there. Uh, Duan Wu is one of my contest winners, and I've got, I don't know, numerous wins of finalists, semifinalists, and wins on Game Crackers Design stuff. But I'm more known for a lot of the games I have illustrations and graphic design work in. Here's just a few. Um, I have my hands in lots of pies. Uh, anywhere from either just doing logos, just doing pre-press, or entire games, including illustrations, graphic design, and pre-press. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Chris cuts the game up there. Uh, let's see, I'm also, uh, I work for the Game Crafter. I'm their concierge. I'm also the one who selected your speakers today. Uh, set our schedule. <laughs> um, also, hopefully my talk won't go too long, so we can go to dinner early. Um, I'm also the person who does the Follies at the Game Crafter. So if you see me in Discord, I am Alicia, evil overlord of Follies. Um, and I also handle the concierge stuff over at Game Crafter, uh, which is basically taking your files that you formatted and getting them prepped to work with the Game Crafter. So let's say you've actually set your files up for pre-press, but they don't quite work with the Game Crafter, which is not uncommon for a POD service. I'll get those files working on the site. I can create your SVGs for something custom. I can just hold your hand, you know, whether it's like learning how to use the site or if you just need some comfort and want to hold hands, that's fine too. Um, I can help you pick, <laughs> I can help you pick some components for your game. You're like, I don't even know what to use for my game to work on your site. Well, let me pick those for you. Um, I back up customer support and I just lurk around in Discord all the time. And more importantly, I'm a pet owner. Um, this is Taco and Moose dropping their first album. Uh, no, I did not give them a microphone. That is Photoshopped. Uh, and then Marla, my tortoise. But uh, what is pre-press? Like, what am, I, what am I teaching you today? Well, there's like the actual definition up top, but really, I'm just getting your stuff ready for print. Um, it's just kind of all the, the stuff you do before you be like, printer, print this, please. So it's kind of all it really is. But what kind of tools do you need to use for this? Because this is kind of the part that people kind of get stuck behind, is like, what tools do I even start with? And it, it really depends on what you're doing. Um, industry standard is going to be the Adobe Suite. Um, there are some programs that work great too, so like the Affinity series is a great uh, substitute for that. Um, also, you may see in our cards is Component Studio, which you guys heard a lot about today. Um, but for me personally, I use the Adobe series. Um, it just makes it quick, easy, and most manufacturers just tell you how to use those programs, which is super helpful. Um, so I have a couple examples up here. Things like cards and booklets, anything that's gonna be like multiple pages or multiple components with iterations, I use InDesign. That's my favorite tool. Um, think of it like if Word and Photoshop had a baby, you'd have InDesign. <laughs> um, you can also use Illustrator for things like cards. I just, I prefer InDesign. Um, I know something we talked about quite a lot today is Component Studio is great for quick changes, rapid iterations. Um, InDesign can do that. You can actually do something called data merging, which is using spreadsheets to quickly make changes to your cards. Uh, you can also quickly import images the same way. It just, it takes a little bit more of that data side of things and less of that art side of things. Definitely still doable. You can get custom scripts installed on these things to run things in batches. So if you're, if you're more of that side of things, it has those abilities. Um, but of course, Component Studio is super niche and really nice. Yeah, what's up? Does Affinity Publisher have that possibility too? I don't know. I never, I haven't like tried to dig into it too much. Uh, I just switched from the Adobe Suite to the Affinity Suite and the answer is yes. Oh, that's awesome. I've been recently teaching myself the Affinity Suite because uh, it's cheaper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in case anybody's not aware, Affinity, the Affinity Suite is like a one-time payment. I think I got it on sale. I got the whole suite for $50. Um, $50 is what I pay monthly for the Adobe, Adobe Suite. Yeah. Um, it's on, I think it's on sale still right now from the Black Monday or Black Friday, whatever. It might be. Yeah. And so my understanding is that they work just as well. It just might take a little bit of knowing and you know, maybe moving some files around to get things to work, but that's usually my go-to. Um, so for things that aren't like cards or booklets, Illustrator is usually your other go-to. So punch boards, stickers, boards, boxes, your die lines, which we'll get into later, um, even surfacing options like spot gloss or something metallic, you're gonna likely be using Illustrator for that. Um, on here, you'll notice there's only one area that has Photoshop listed, and that's boards and boxes, and you're still not really using Photoshop. 
Uh, some people might design their box in Photoshop, um, but generally you're going to be saving that a special way and then putting it in Illustrator, which I'm actually gonna go over later. Because it to be honest, it's all very unique. Yeah, what's up, Chris? Can you get away with uh, like Gantt and Inkscape? You can, <laughs> but you'll have to take some additional steps to make your files work, and I'll go over why in a little bit. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why is PDF exports. Most printers are gonna require a PDF with very specific requirements. Um, these are just some of the requirements, so Adobe 7. Um, CMYK is important in the printer's color profile. Um, some programs don't even do color profile. Some won't even print in CMYK, or sorry, save in CMYK. For example, the illustration program I use for my drawings doesn't do CMYK. So all my drawings are generally in red, green, blue, which I'm also gonna cover in a little bit. Um, so sometimes those involve additional converting to get them to work in some programs. Um, 300 DPI is just the size and scale of your images, 300 minimum, three millimeter bleed, which we're also gonna go over, and then pure black text. This is all a lot. Literally when my next word says, huh? <laughs> it's a lot of terms, it's a lot. But I wanna give you examples of each of these so you can more easily follow along. Let's start with the big three. Bleed, margins, and drift. Every printer, industry standards, they're all gonna have this. Uh, here's my example, Game Crafter, and that's from Panda, which you can tell by the Panda. <laughs> um, main, some difference you might find, and essentially any printer you go to, three millimeter bleed, three, three millimeter margin, Game Crafter is the only really exception you're gonna find to that, and maybe some other print on demand, where they do a uh, quarter inch, so like one, or 0 0.125 or eighth inch um, for bleed and margins. Now, what is a bleed, what is a margin, what is drift? So imagine you have your cut line. So in this case, it's this red one right here. Uh, that is gonna be this exact size of your component. So in this case, I have a card. And let's say your card is a poker card. Uh, let's use some freedom units here. So two and a half by three and a half inches is your standard American poker card. Uh, in this case, the bleed, which is your blue part, is three millimeters on top and bottom, three millimeters on left and right. So that's gonna be your bleed. So let's say your card has a solid red background. Your solid red background needs to go to that cut line and then extend past that to cover all this bleed. That's because, let's say they cut the card and it's slightly off center. That's not because you uploaded off center art. It's because sometimes when you're printing on big machines, things shift a little bit from where you printed to where they're cutting at. That's drift. That's why bleed's important, because if you didn't fill that area in, you'd have a white line on the edge of your card. That's also why margins are important. The margin's the safe area where your components are like, I'm safe in here, I won't get cut off, no matter how much drift I have, right? Because anything past that margin, your printer's gonna reprint it. That's usually a big defect, not okay. So that's, your, that's kind of your safe area. I recommend choking that in a bit. Um, so for example, this is three millimeters, maybe bring it in five millimeters, and that's just gonna make your card feel a little less crowded. But in general, anything like text, icons, logos, important parts of your graphics, put them inside that margin, everything else outside of that shouldn't be important. Yeah, Chris. In your opinion, how much can you take a chance on it being consistently okay, but the long run versus something like POD? Sure, so uh, with POD, I wouldn't recommend pushing it. Um, mostly because they're doing one-off prints, and the cost of reprinting that one thing is more expensive than, let's say you're going with Panda, you're ordering 2,000 copies, they can put extra effort in, and sometimes for an added cost, to make sure there's little or no drift. There's always likely gonna be some drift, um, but a lot of big manufacturers, when they're printing that many, they can run 100 copies, and then that will just basically be added to your cost, and they go, hey, okay, we've narrowed it in, we can get less drift this way. So some companies will just be like, yeah, we'll, we'll narrow it in more if you really need that edge, which you might find on games like Magic the Gathering with that tiny, thin border. Um, if you might notice, that, that cut next to that margin, that drift can be anywhere from that cut line to that margin. So that whole area could be gone. That's like less than the size of Magic the Gathering's black edge. There's no way they're getting that unless they're doing spe something special to their prints. Some printers, especially big ones like Panda or Longpack, could probably do something like it for you. But I don't recommend cutting it close, um, which is also why I don't recommend borders. I prefer big open designs, so nothing around the edges it just makes for a nice cleaner look. Here's some examples of something where I cut too close. On purpose, of course. I don't make mistakes. 
um, you'll see the edge of this logo cuts right up against that margin. I mean, it's right on that line. And so this is what it would look like if it was cut perfectly. And here's what it looks like with maximum drift. That white of that logo, sorry, I'll move, is cut off a bit. So if I had choked that in more and be careful, was careful of that margin, there's never a chance it would have gotten cut off. And so of course, now what it looks like, it printed perfectly. <laughs> but again, choking things in a bit, it'll make things look less crowded. So another term to be important of is, or to be aware of is die lines. Um, generally, this is what the printer is going to use to cut your components. If it's something standard like a poker card, they have these, they can give them to you. It's what you're going to use essentially as your template. Um, if they don't have them or you're doing something custom, here's a good rule of thumb. So let's say, for example, your cut area, or your box, needs to be 26 millimeters. Sorry, no more freedom units from here on out. <laughs> um, so it needs to be 26 millimeters. We talked earlier that your drift, or sorry, not your drift, your bleed is three millimeters on each side, which is a total of six millimeters. So it's not three millimeters total, it's six it's for every side. So you're gonna increase that for your bleed, where you, know, you extend your artwork to, by six millimeters. So now you have another square, 32, that's your bleed. And then you're gonna do your margin. Go the other way, minus six. Again, three from each side. So this is essentially, you just made your own template for your component. I'm gonna go over a little bit more detail on making these, but as a general rule of thumb, that's essentially what you're gonna do. These need to be vector for your printer. So Inkscape could work for something like this if it saves as PDFs. Generally, we use like Illustrator, or I believe it's Affinity. Uh, I'm always terrible with this. Affinity Publisher? No, design, design, Affinity Designer. Whichever one does the vector stuff. But again, it needs to export as PDF because it needs to be a vector. Um, and this is just so they can make your die appropriately and effectively and accurately. They usually won't take anything other than a vector PDF. A couple more terms we're gonna learn about today. There's more of these, I swear. <laughs> uh, so raster, vector, and PPI or DPI. Raster uh, is a type of image that is made up of pixels. So if you zoom really close to it, you're gonna see all the little square pixels. Um, this is common for some art files. It's common for icons, layouts, logos, sometimes. Uh, general images, and it can be scaled down. You often might see them made really big, and then they scale them down for things like cards. For example, a Magic the Gathering card art might be multiple feet in length. It might even be a real picture or a real painting, and then it's scaled down for the card. Vector, so you're gonna get that in something like Illustrator. Often it's your text. Almost all fonts are a uh, vector, unless they're a bitmap font, and sometimes they'll sneak in, so watch out for those. Um, again, your die cuts are gonna be in vector. Logos are often in vector. Screen printing, so if you're printing on um, like a piece of custom wood, sometimes it's gonna be a vector. It's usually the best way to do that. Um, custom cuts, um, so if you're having wood cut for your game, you need custom wooden shapes. Those are gonna be vector. And they're scalable infinitely. Essentially, if your computer can handle it, you can scale it as big as you need to, up or down. Yeah, Chris. Oh yeah. Yes. Hesitantly. No. So <laughs> I've never done it in Inkscape. Okay. I do it a ton in Illustrator, okay. um, and that's because occasionally I'll have a client be like, "Hey, Alicia, can you make this into a banner that we can hang up at our convention? It needs to be ten feet by seven feet." I'm calling out to a couple of my clients right now. Um, this was a recent request, and I'm like, "Yeah, not a problem. Definitely didn't draw it that big." Drop it into Illustrator, tell it to uh, live paint it with like max settings, let my computer run itself haggard for a couple minutes. Um, there's a reason why I buy gaming computers for my work. Not just because I'm a gamer, but because they're powerful. Um, and it'll make a really, really good design. If you zoom really far in, you can sometimes see slight gradients, but like it's not a deal breaker. Um, it still usually looks pretty good. And especially when you're not gonna be looking this close at a banner, you're gonna be looking at banners like way out here, it works great. I would just be cautious of um, color changes, uh, be cautious of, sometimes it can make lines kind of blurry. Is that a question? Oh, okay, just stretching, I feel you. <laughs> um, so it is doable, but I would just, you know, be careful of what it might change. It might change something without you realizing it changed it, but generally it's not too bad. Um, yes, so they're scalable. Uh, essentially, vector just scales infinitely up or down, which can be great. 
And then PPI and DPI is just a term for printing something, essentially, the resolution it's printed at. Um, so pixels per inch is essentially how many pixels, literal squares, you have in an inch of image versus like dots per inch, which is just the dots when they printed. But it's not super important. What is important is that when you're making your files, especially if they're raster files, um, this 2.75 by 3.75, sorry, more freedom units, uh, at 300 resolution or 300 DPI is the same as all those other crazy numbers at 72. And that's just because it's just math. It's just multiplying the numbers by each other and they equal the same. Yeah, that's why I said all those numbers. <laughs> Math's not my thing, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Boo, numbers. <laughs> but when it comes to something that's, and that's more important for raster, when it comes to vector, you're sending them a PDF that's already to size that's vector. They just know what size is. They don't need to worry about it necessarily unless you're adding in raster images. Um, but uh, in case people aren't aware, that is the size of an actual poker card file before it's cut. Uh, so then again, it's the same size as that. So keep in mind that your resolution, while you might say it's at 72, it, if it looks weird like that, it's because it's just, your program opened it funny, just change the resolution to 300 and it should correct itself. Um, that's mostly why I included it, because I'll notice that sometimes when I open templates from printers, it shows up weird like this. And that's why. But some more terms to think about. Okay, so red, green, blue. Who knows what a red, green, blue color space is? Oh, there's a couple out there. What about CMYK? I'm sure you guys have heard that term before, right? Who knows the main difference other than ones for computers and ones for print? I thought it was one as well. Additive and subtractive. True, additive and subtractive. Yeah, yeah it's pigment versus light. Yep. Um, another big thing that I like about it is that most people don't know, and the reason why um, you might say something like, well, you can't use red, green, blue images when you're printing, but you can use CMYK, and why you need to convert them, it's because all red, green, blue colors include everything in CMYK. CMYK includes nothing of our green, blue colors, in, an, in this example at least. This will make more sense. So all visible light is that outside area. So all visible colors that we can see with our eyes, and probably more than we cannot see with our eyes. Then you have the red, green, blue area, which is a smaller section of that. And then CMYK is inside that area. So if you have a color of red, green, blue that's not in that CMYK color space, it's not going to print. It's going to change colors on you when printed, especially if you don't convert it properly. So it's important to keep in mind that that's why converting your files is important. So like when I'm drawing something in my Clip Studio Paint program that doesn't use CMYK, I have to be careful what colors I select because it could be changing my colors on me. The only thing to keep in mind with your artists is if they aren't designing in CMYK, you might have to end up converting their files to make them work and print properly or else you're gonna be like, this is printing not how I expected, which happens more than you think. Um, but yeah, so RGB, uh, good for computer graphics, video games, your website. You may even end up making some RGB files specifically for advertising. CMYK is for print, specifically offset printing. And what's really interesting about CMYK, so uh, who knows what the K stands for? What's the actual word for it though? Yep, so key, um, key plate. Uh, essentially black, so 100% black. Um, something interesting about that is that generally there's four wells when printing and offset printing. Um, there's actually a fifth well that you can fill for metallic paints, uh, spot colors, uh, Pantones, if anybody has a Pantone subscription anymore. Um, also, <laughs> you can use it specifically for your fonts in K or in black, and they can swap it out easily for new language prints of your game. So your game's coming out in five different languages, they can swap one well for all your languages instead of having to redo all of your printing wells, which is way more expensive. So it can save you a ton of money. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. That's also why CMYK is important. And then um, overprinting. We're gonna get into this just a little bit. Um, in programs like Illustrator and InDesign, there's a, literally just a little checkbox that you're gonna mark on your text that says overprint. And this is essentially a way of making sure that your programs print, or not your program, sorry, that the printer prints your black text on top of everything else instead of cutting them out of each other. Mainly you're gonna use it for text. Uh, you might use it for a stroke on a, on a font. Um, but essentially it's gonna avoid white gaps. I'm gonna show you an example of this. Um, some companies may ask you to outline your text, but that's more rare. So here's an example of overprinting and not overprinting. So overprinting is where they literally mix your colors together. I'm sure some of you have probably seen that before where uh, magenta and cyan make blue and so on and so forth. And then you see how there's no white, there's like right there, versus right there, there's this white outline. And that's because if you're overprinting something, it literally knocks itself out of the other object. 
So it leaves these gaps around it. So if you don't overprint your text, it's gonna leave those gaps. It can also sometimes make it blurry, it just doesn't look right. So this is a good reason to set your text to overprint. Now, we're gonna actually get into some pre-pressing. Uh, in this example, I'm using two games I did recently, semi-recently, uh, Sheet Boomba by One Day West Games, printed from Gameland, and Polarized, printed by AdMagic, by Polarized Game Labs. I believe that's still currently actively printing. I believe it should be done soon. Um, so they're gonna be featured here a lot. But when we go into pre-press, we're gonna make some assumptions here. You already have your components selected. You know what size cards you want, so you know what kind of size boards you want. You've contacted your printer, they've given you your sizes. You're essentially ready to have your files prepared and ready to go. And I'm not talking about like having your art prepared. Your art's done. You're ready to start assembling everything. You've selected your printer, so we're, we're, we're essentially like, let's get the foot through the door, let's get this done. My Kickstarter's funded, I've paid everybody. You're ready to go. Some of these things can change along the way, but as long as you're you know, there, you're ready for the next step, which is asking for templates or making your own templates. Most printers will just give you templates if you ask for them. It might take them a couple days, but they'll just make them for you. Some printers won't, but you can also just make your own. And we're gonna go over that a little bit here, but generally, if they send you a uh, template, it's in a PDF format, because remember, PDFs are what everybody's gonna be using for this, and you can usually just drop them into your program. If you're dropping them into InDesign, you're gonna have to make your, pro your file first. In Illustrator, you can just drop it in, it'll open it. You can also, of course, make them from scratch. You're also gonna ask them for something called an export profile and their color profile if they don't have it listed on their website, which we're gonna get into here in a little bit. But, so here's what a template looks like, just straight from a printer. It's essentially what it looks like when you open it as a PDF. It's gonna have all your basic information we talked about, your margins. They said trim, I say cut, bleed, its size, non-freedom units, <laughs> the bleed required. Just, just standard, uh, kind of standard template you've probably seen before. Here's a box template they gave me. Literally just asked them for the box, they sent me the box template. Super helpful, I don't have to make it myself. Especially with those little like wingies on the side, I hate those. They're so annoying to make. But they'll just give it to you. And I'm gonna show you a tip later on how to get some made if they won't give you one. <laughs> this is a template I made. Super basic, right? Just a bunch of squares put together. The, my, I use different colors here. So the black is actually my trim line, and the red is the bleed, and you see how everything kind of just lines up together? So again, super easy. You're just making shapes and putting them together. This one's a little bit more complicated. This is for a double layered board. So there's a lot more things cut out here than you might expect. This was literally like a puzzly border. Yeah, Chris, what's up? Oh, I would hate that. Uh, last printer I had that had a sheet like that, I think was AdMagic, but I just sent them my PDF, and I'll show you how I set up my PDFs in a moment here, um, and they did that on their own. They did that on their side. Um, if some printers do that, I would absolutely hate it, but I could see it being something I would probably put together in Illustrator instead of InDesign, or something I might put together in InDesign and then export it for Illustrator. Um, but I'll get into that in just a little bit, because I haven't had a printer do that in a while, I think a lot of them just use the PDF basics for now, but I'll see, I'll, I can also look into it. But um, here's just a, a vector for um, cutting out custom wooden shapes. Literally just black shapes, custom size. They were sized the way I needed them. Sent them the PDF, that's all they needed. The sizes was already in there because I told the program what size it was, super easy. Okay, InDesign, setting up your cards. When you open InDesign, you're gonna have a box that looks just like this on the, the black box over here. And you're just gonna fill in your requirements the non-freedom units for a poker card. <laughs> the margins we talked about, right? Three, if you want, more, you want a little bit more of a margin, you want a little more safe zone, increase those numbers. Same with the bleed here. And then you're just gonna literally create it and it gives you this example over here. It gives you your margin line, it gives you your bleed line, so you're good to go. If you're not quite sure, maybe you're like, oh, maybe I put my numbers in wrong, just drag and drop in your template. If everything lines up, you're good to go. Then you're gonna make your cards. Naming your layers is important. I'm gonna tell you right now, La name your layers. You'll see later I didn't name my layers. Name your layers, it's important. Because <laughs> then you can easily alter things, edit things, and you'll see every page on here is a different card. When you export this, it's gonna save every single page as a different card, and then the very last page is your, the back card. 
Now, if cards have specific backs, for example, they're not all, they all have like a unique back, you're gonna go front, back, front, back, front, back. Is usually how a printer will take it. Sometimes they're just gonna be like, well, give me one PDF per card. But printers are usually pretty specific, specific on what they want. So in this case, I have the name at the top and the text at the bottom are the only things in here that's vector. Everything else is a raster image that was drawn in another program. You can bring these in in a couple different ways. Um, I was notorious for using PNGs for a while until I realized InDesign takes TIFFs. Uh, a TIFF is a CMYK based image file where PNGs are not. It's not a huge problem if you designed them in CMYK, but TIFFs are gonna be the way you wanna go, uh, as it says down here, raster designs, TIFFs. But here's an example of something that's almost completely vector based in InDesign. Text, fun, all these shapes are all vector made in InDesign, except for this little sunburst out here, which I made separately. So essentially, almost the whole thing is vector. Uh, I named these just for the screenshot. They were not named. <laughs> <laughs> and again, every single layer, or sorry, every single page in here is uh, its own card. Uh, for booklets, you're gonna enter your booklet size. It's very similar. Oh my god, I hate, I'm sorry, I hate millimeters. Like, what is 0.55? You know how small 0.55 millimeters is? It's tiny. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, booklets are gonna have very similar margins. You'll notice I set mine to six millimeter, and that's because I like to take into account the margin of the book where it folds. And that's what I would say is bare minimum. I would double that for your booklet. Um, and that's just because if you ever have a booklet with things too close to the edge, it's crowded, it feels like it was cut funny. When, when, you know, be cautious with your chokes. I, I call them chokes, but bring your margins in more and it'll look more professional. But bare minimum, I say six. You can also select right here, what I didn't do for the cards is facing pages. This allows you to do full spreads. So you can have something that borders two pages and has stuff in the middle. So you can see I have the border here that kind of goes along the top. Uh, booklets you're gonna assemble is very similar to cards. Every page is literally a page in your book and you're gonna export it as a PDF and they'll just kind of take it. Some printers, I've had printers in the past that actually make you put the spreads together. Um, if you've ever had like a stapled, a staple or saddle stitch booklet, if you take it apart, you might notice that page two is attached to like page six. You sometimes you have to put that together yourself. I've done pages backwards. I'm not kidding. Yeah, I'm just like, I will literally take a physical book and number pages and then try to figure that out. But some, pay, some printers are great and they'll take it, you know, just as a PDF with one page per page, literally. Some will make you put the sheet together, but you spread it together, but usually it's not too bad. Um, here's a very simple box template. Uh, I don't remember where I got it from, but super simple. They don't need to be anything fancy. This is what I was talking about earlier. So if you're in something like uh, Photoshop, image, mode, CMYK, that's how you're gonna make sure you're in the right color profile. Uh, or using CMYK imagery for your files when saving them as TIFFs to drop them into Illustrator. So here's an example, I saved as TIFF. And then I literally just drag and drop them into Illustrator with the template on top, and then I hide the template, and you're good to go. It's, it's, it seems scary at first, but it's, it's not. As long as you do your file prep, you set up your file correctly, you're in the right color space, you're essentially good to go. Punch boards, um, in this case, this is the ugly one I made earlier. You'll notice that there's a small gap between where the bleed is of the punch outs and the actual punch board. I just threw a random image in there. Didn't need to be anything fancy, just I didn't want white space. No one wants white space. Do, do, pointing the wrong direction. There we go. And that's what it looks like, just overlaid. The double layered boards. Uh, a lot of games have these now. They're like my favorite. Essentially, you're just having a perfect square for, or not perfect square, but a square for your board and then all your cuts on top and then you just overlay them. And you know, I literally just have the same graphic here and just make sure everything kind of lines up nice. Now here's a big part when you're saving your PDFs out of any program, the export profiles, which I told you to make sure you ask your printer for. Printers have requirements essentially for what they need for their files. This tells your program, here's all the settings, just do it. Take care of it for me. I don't want to have to go through and manually change them. I use these two for every other printer. <laughs> I just swap out their color profiles for whatever the color profile is for that printer. Chris, did you have another question? No, I was just trying to Oh, 
<laughs> I keep getting caught by those. <laughs> um, what is a color profile? It's essentially how your program or your file, uh, files, talk to the printer, the physical machine. It's like, here's how I read my colors, here's how I want you to read my colors. So that's how their machine reads colors. You need to tell your file, this is how it reads colors, print properly, essentially. Uh, printer, some printers are different. Uh, long pack is US. I've had some that are Japan web coded. Um, so it just, you'll be able to, um, when you're actually exporting, you'll be able to change your color profile if needed. But those two, I'm gonna show you how to download them later. You can use them for essentially any company. They usually have pretty basic standard settings. Uh, if you're exporting InDesign, you're going to be setting overprint. We talked a little bit about that earlier, making sure your text is nice. Um, in uh, InDesign, if they need outline, you probably won't need outline. I haven't had a company need outline in a long time, so you can probably ignore that, but just in case, you can find outline by going to type, create outline. Overprint is Windows output attributes. You're literally just gonna click on the text and just click overprint stroke. In this case, it's just the stroke because the stroke's the only thing black or overprint fill when it's just the text. Super simple set step. If you do this when you're setting up your file, you'll never have to do it again. It's, you're like, I want my cards to have this, this is what my text is, the text is always gonna be overfill, bam, every card you create from there will have that setting. Uh, here it is an illustrator. Um, it's very kind of similar um, for outlines. There's actually just a quick action bar on the side of illustrator. You can just click the button or you can just right click the text and overprint in Windows, it's just Windows attributes, so it's actually one less step, which is nice. But again, uh, just setting it up right away when you're making your files, so you don't have to set it up again. It's important. Um, one thing to think about, when you are doing the outline option, it will convert your text to a shape, so it won't be editable anymore. Editable. <laughs> it won't be editable anymore. Um, so save your file as a separate file. Name it, whatever your file is, outlined, so that way you know if you ever need to go back and change something, you change one that's editable, I, I can't, <laughs> editable, uh, and then you can resave that file over. Because if you, try to op if you try to save over, if you save over that file, you're not gonna have editable text anymore, and that's gonna be a pain. Uh, so when you're saving in any of these programs, essentially, you're just gonna go right to your PDFs, and look at that, look at those, right there, those profiles, right in the program, look how easy that is. I use, I use Longpack and Panda for most printers, especially if they have the same color profile. So yeah, just right in there, Adobe PDF presets, right down there. Let's get into naming a little bit. Every printer is a little different, but remember when I said about naming your layers? Naming your files properly is also very important. Gee, I wonder what game this is for. <laughs> Printer won't make the mistake, they'll know what game that's for. What component is this for? Oh, well, that's easy. Especially when you have, like, in this case, they had like 200 something cards in multiple different categories. So I just named them. These are action cards. These are dangerous topic cards. Super easy, right? Fun topic cards. And then I follow it by the size so I know what size those are. Because sometimes games have lots of cards, but they're in different sizes. So that's another thing. Sizes. And then in this case, these punch outs are the fronts and backs of just that punch out. So I know that has everything I need in it. I didn't have a separate file for it. Naming your files is important so you always know when you made it when you edited it, if it's in the right place, what it's for, and also it's good when the printer needs to check those things, especially if you're sending them multiple iterations. Saving, I should, I should make a screenshot of it, but under output is usually where you'll change that color profile if you need to. If you're lucky, you won't need to. <laughs> uh, so again, these are just my final files, but here's how some of them turned out. So you got those double layer boards, that little weird puzzle thing with all the pieces. These are the cool sheep I had cut out, the cards. Here's a close-up on the custom barns and sheeps. I even designed an insert. This is my first insert I made, isn't that cool? Literally just sketched it and the, the printer did all the work. <laughs> and I took these screenshots off of a video, so they're kind of bad, but yeah, I mean, as long as you have your file set up right and your, your printer's gonna check them, and we're gonna go over checking files in a little bit, you're essentially good to go. Things usually print pretty good. Um, I have a couple resources for people. So these are just a list of random printers that I've used most of these. Um, they're just long run printers, printers that are most common in the industry, I would say, and used most often. Um, 
my favorites are probably these top three, followed by Ad Magic. Um, is that supposed to be Panda or Panda? <laughs> it's a typo. I'm not responsible for any typos. Um, yeah, Panda GM, uh, Panda General Manufacturing. Here's a link to their tools, which I'm going to go over in a second, along with Long Packs tools. Let's take a look. <laughs> Just a heads up, my screen's not working, so I'm going to be looking over my shoulder. Right? Da, da, da. I am still mad at you. It is still mad at me. <laughs> or her, not me. Okay, so literally you just go to Panda GM. You go to their website, .com, and they have this whole tools page, just under tools, that has the best tools you're ever gonna find. So good. I love it. It's amazing. First, you have this guidebook, which literally goes everything over everything I just told you, but in more detail with cool pictures. Uh, I have I have a printed version of this in my house. I'm not even kidding. I have one for them and I think one for Longpack that I printed myself. They're great. And component catalogs, there's some like components. Here's some of my favorite things. They have a template generator. What if the printer didn't give you a box template? What if you don't wanna make it? Well, let's go to the two-piece box. Let's enter some random sizes of what we want. Let's go, I don't know, oh God, millimeters. I don't know, 150 millimeters, is that a big size? I have no idea. No. 0.055. It's like, I don't know, 50 millimeters. This is gonna be a tiny box, I'm not sure. And it's made of two millimeter, because that's important. And then we're just gonna download that. I have no good, oh, there you go, that was quick. There you go, look at that, I have a template. Look how quick that was. Isn't that amazing? And you can do that for game boards, punch outs, mats, paper sheets, cards, pads. Use it. I do. It's easy. What else do they have that's awesome? Dice templates. This cool component spec sheet. Show you to make a spec sheet if you need it for some reason. Box markings. These are important, especially if you're printing in China or the EU or a place that requires the CE certification and choking hazard symbols. This is as important as a game, as a game cracker. They won't have you. They also won't have rules requirements. But printing at something like Panda, they'll require those. You download them right there. Hey, look, it's the X, it's the profiles I told you about. They're right there. You can just download them. So easy that is. Long pack's the same way. Long pack has the same kind of stuff. All these books that you can read and learn stuff. Template resources. You don't need the quotations unless you're using them. But <laughs> go to their sites. Check them out. I love these resources. I use them almost every day. I'm just like, what was that thing I'm supposed to know? And then I pull it up. It is not a, it's not a closed book test, everybody. You can do research. It's important. Um, one thing that was on here. Pre-flight profi pre profiles. This is essentially what they do your files when you send them to them. If you have Adobe, especially if you're paying the price I'm paying, you get the uh, Adobe DC Pro or whatever, you can literally check your files before they check your files. So they have this uh, do -do -do, use production print. You download their profile. You bring it into the program. You click pre-flight. And we're like, oh, where is it? There you go. Look, the imported profile for Panda. Let's analyze this file that I made. Oh, look, there's no problems. <laughs> Where is that? In Adobe, what is this, DC Pro, okay. under pre-flight, you can download the Panda's pre-flight profile, and it installs into Adobe. And then you can essentially just run it, and it'll tell you if there's a problem with your profile or your program. For example, I forgot to mark this text as overprint. Or uh, there's a bunch of RGB files in my thing I totally forgot about that weren't converted properly. It'll tell you those things. You forgot to embed your font. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be a problem if you use the pre-profile exports that they give you, because it does it automatically. <laughs> so it tells you, oh, hey, there's a thing wrong with my file. But of course, you can just send it to your printer and the printer will tell you these things, but it might save you a day or two of emailing them. Do to do, I have so many tabs open. They're my emotional support tabs. <laughs> I swear I closed like 20 of them before I came up here. <laughs> In conclusion, talk to your printer. They're gonna give you everything you need usually. Sometimes they'll just give you your templates. Bleed, bleed, bleed. Not a threat. Literally just bleed your files. It's very important. And then your proper export settings. Also super important. What time am I on? Oh my God, I'm gonna get done early. And that's me. I'm Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> You can find me on my website, alicia at aliciadoesart.com. 
or alicia at aliciasart.com is my email. I'm also at Alicia Volkman on essentially every social media platform. Illustrations, graphic design, pre-press, and just random shenanigans is me. I want that option. The shenanigans? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. it uh, yeah, you got questions? Yeah.